praise you, Lord. We exalt you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your resurrection, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for new life this morning. We worship you in spirit and in truth this morning, God. We thank you for the fullness that we have in being part of your family, Lord, the family of God. And as we worship you this morning, receive our praise. Answer the cries of our hearts. This morning, God, for those who are suffering, for those who are in need this morning, God, that you would touch them, season them, Lord, with your spirit, God. Reign on them today with your heart and with your love, Lord. Let no one here feel a sense of lack of love from you, God, but just pour out your love upon them this morning, we pray. We thank you, Lord, for meeting our every need this morning, God. And we worship you and give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, today, I, want, I would like to continue what we studied last week. So if you missed last week, there's an opportunity to go to MontrealChurch.ca and check the first part of this message, Blessings of a Positive Attitude. And today, we're going to have part two at the conclusion of this message. Now, uh, we started by mentioning a Bible verse, which is in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Uh, that says, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, if there by any virtue and if there by any praise, the Bible says, think on these things. So, in order to uh, have a positive attitude, we need to think and not occupy our mind thinking about good things. So last week, we uh, read how Jesus gave the example of a tree and the fruit of the tree, saying that the good tree has good fruit and the bad tree has bad fruit. And the fruit of the tree, in comparison to a person, refers to the things we do to our actions and to the things we say. So uh, we also uh, read in Scripture that Jesus said that our heart is like a treasure. So if you, if you fill your heart with good things, your mouth will speak out of good things. But if you fill your heart with bad things, will, you will speak evil things. So uh, it's very clear in Scripture that according to the things we fill our heart, this is going to transpire in attitudes towards other people. Now let me ask you how many of you heard the expression, God is in control? Well, Christians love to say this thing. You know, there's an accident, oh, God is in control. Uh, something bad happens, oh, I'm not upset because God is in control. Now, let me make this clear to you. In heaven, God is in control. Here on earth, He's not always in control. Does this shock you? I want to shock you a little bit so you'll understand what I'm saying. Because as Christians, we sometimes say things that don't make very sense. They don't make much sense. Sometimes God is not in control of what's happening in our lives. But we have the option of giving Him the driver's seat or stay ourselves there. As we listened in the previous testimony, it was with reluctancy that this couple, the Turnbull, Turnbulls, were giving uh, their offerings and tithes because there was some reluctancy in their hearts. God was not in control. You see, their actions was, were, uh, okay, we give our offering, but they couldn't experiment the promise of Malachi, as they read, that where God says, I, uh, I will open up the floodgates of heaven, but you need to test me. So they decided to change attitude. Okay, everything in life and everything in God's kingdom has to do with attitude. If you've lost your job, if you have a sickness, if you're going through hardships now, please don't tell me that God is in control. Someone else is in control. And we need to remove the forces that are dragging you to a downfall by giving the Lordship to Jesus Christ. When we give our heart to Jesus Christ, when we invite Him as our Lord and Savior, now we can start saying, well, He's in control. Is He in control of your finances? Is He in control of your household? 
Well, in order for him to be in control, let me just go a little bit further. Everything you do, everything, every action should be for the glory of God. Now, Paul the Apostle put it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Are you doing all for the glory of God? So, how can you give glory to God with what you eat? That's a hard question. Shall we eat chocolates? Once in a while. <laughs> Shall we abstain from eating pork and, uh, and all the things from the Old Testament? Sh shall we, what shall we do in order to give glory to God? Very simple. We need to be thankful for what we have. And we need to give steps of faith and thanking even for what we hope for. And as we do so, we give the Lordship to Christ. You see, a change of attitude is nothing easy. But all of us have something that the Bible mentions as a spiritual bar. Now, when in Acts chapter 3 we see the first happenings, the first things that were happening with the church, we, we, we can read uh, that Jesus ascended to heaven, there was a downpour of the Spirit, and we, we read in Scripture that we, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, they were speaking in tongues in chapter 2, then on chapter 3 we see an event where two of the apostles walked to the temple and there was a beggar there and in Acts chapter 3 verse 6 they told this man silver and gold have I none but such as I have given uh, give in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise up and walk and this man was healed not only he walked but he jumped and not only he jumped but he danced and he entered the temple dancing saying I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed and everybody was in shock because in the temple you cannot bother God. You see, some churches they speak like this because you know this is a very holy place and we need to speak like this. Listen, God is life. He created us, and He is in the temple, and He is pleased when we praise Him from all of our hearts. So as this man jumped and entered the temple, people were offended with what he was doing. And they asked him, what happened to you? And he said, I was healed in the name of Jesus Christ. And they were even more offended. So they called the ones that were the instruments of healing. And they asked him, what name or authority have you done these things? And they said, in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ, the name above all name, the name above all name on earth, on, in heaven. He is the Messiah. He is the one you rejected. But He healed this man. And, and He was so happy. These people were a little bit confused. And after listening to the apostles, in Acts 4.13, it says they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Tell the person next to you, they had been with Jesus. Praise God. Have you been with Jesus? Really? We're supposed to. And you may ask, how can I be with Jesus if He's not here? I have news for you. He's here right now. Whenever for me, I get in His name. He's here. You know, He is there when you wake up and you say, Glory to God another day. Yeah. He is there when you're at work and you say, God, I thank you for the wonderful day of, of work. Let me be productive and be the best employee of, of this firm. He is there when you go to school and you say, God, protect me, uh, teach me, I open my heart to you. He is there whenever you give thanks to the Lord. Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Now we do so many things that don't bring glory to the Lord. So we need to learn how to test our attitudes. What is your passion? What is the thing you like the most? What are, what are those things that really excite you, that provoke your interest, that stimulate your thoughts, that motivates you in your life? Is it your job? Maybe it is, I don't know. Maybe a boyfriend or a girlfriend. 
you get really excited. I'm going to meet my boyfriend or my girlfriend. And uh, possibly your spouse, your grandchildren. You know, some of you are, are grandparents now. How many grandparents here? How many of you carry a picture of your grandchild? And, and, oh, lots of you. That excites you. And sometimes you try to show the picture and you're upset because the other person doesn't care about, about the grandchild. But you care and you get all stuff. See the picture. See, just like me. I don't know what excites you. Is it music? Is it uh, computers, a hobby, video games? There's a lot of things that are exciting. But the question is, what is your real passion? If your real passion are those things, let me tell you, they will pass away, eventually they will die, and one day you will have nothing. But when we learn to have passion for Jesus Christ, passion for the Word of God, passion for the world to come, then your life changes, then your attitudes change, because suddenly you're not focusing on things of this earth, but you're thinking the future. You're setting your eyes upon Jesus, the author of our faith. And when you do so, something is about to change in your life. But as we test ourselves, we should ask, how do I use my time? How do you use your time? You know, I, I know we, we have a limited time here. We try to do the service in 70 minutes. Believe it or not, we're able to do it. And we try to limit time. And, and of course, the Holy Spirit manifests. We'll be here for an hour, two hours, three days, ten days. Doesn't matter. Amen. But we manage our time. Do you separate time every day to put God first? How do you spend your money? It's yours. God gave it to you. Spend it. Will you use some to honor God? What do you read and watch? There's plenty of good books we can read. I know the Bible is the good book, but probably you read some other books, you watch some movies. What do you listen to? You can listen to talk radio, you can listen to, you know, uh, any artist, uh, lady or boy gaga, I don't know what, uh, <laughs> what it is now. Because uh, uh, she's now cross-dressing like a man, so I don't know if it's a boy or lady. But what are you listening to? Do you spend time listening to, you know, worship music? What do you enjoy doing? Are you interested in sharing your faith? You know, this is so important because this is, it should be you and assessing what you are, not me. I'm here just to try to convey a message to you. Jesus Christ loves you. And He has healed you. And He has a special purpose for you. And as we enter in that purpose, and as we spend time with God, as we put God first, then in our financial situation, even if it's tough, we separate the, the premises. We separate the, the first fruits to the Lord. We separate time to read the Bible. We put aside time for the things that really matter. Test your heart. And as you test your heart, I want to challenge you to put God first. If you don't put God first in your life, you're wasting your life. You're wasting an opportunity. And what does it mean to make to put it first? I just tried to put this uh, analogy just to help. First, first thing we need to focus. We need to focus in what really matters. I, I started by telling you that sometimes God is not in control. And this is shocking for some people. Because people are used to say God is in control, God is in control, God is in control. Let me tell you. If everything is in control, probably you drive it, drive it too slow. <laughs> if you go on a highway, like 60 kilometers per hour, everything is in control. If you go 120, then it's when I think you're in the limit of being in control, 
or letting you know a deer or something run in front of you and you will lose control. Sometimes in life we're running fast and sometimes we go very slow. If your life is at a slow pace, everything is in control. But are you achieving your dreams? Think about it. There's a time and a season to run. And when you run towards the goal, not everything is in control. But we need to focus in what really matters. I, in first, stands for identity. You need to find who you are in Christ. Some people have a poor self-image. They think they're a low life, that they're poor. They're not in intelligent enough or bright enough. But God sent His Son to this world to redeem you. And He wants to give you the Holy Spirit. And when you have the Holy Spirit, you have a new identity. You're not Joe and Mary anymore or whoever you are. But now you're a child of the living God. You're a child of the King. You have access to the promises of the Word of God. You have access to these wonderful promises of the Bible. And you can go to the, to the throne room and meet Jesus Christ and receive from Him directly. Isn't this amazing? But you need to know your identity. Now R stands for respect. When you put God first, you respect Him. You honor Him. You fear Him. But you also respect others. You respect, well, if you're at the church, you respect the offices of the church. You respect those that serve. You respect the deacons. You respect the pastors. You respect others around you. In your workplace, you respect your job. In your school, you respect your teachers. Because if you don't have an understanding of authority, you cannot put God first. Then you are first. Because it's about what you think and not what about God thinks. Or not what about those that God set in place think. God established authority on earth. It's not our idea. It's not our invention. God established. So we need to understand this important area of respect. And S stands for serving. If you put God first, you serve God and you serve others. Either you come to our food bank, either you, you do something else, but you set a time, a, a time in your life, in your busy schedule, where you say, I'm going to serve. And T stands for telling others. Telling what? Telling about the wonderful relationship you have with, with God. Telling that your life changed because now you're not going on your own way, but now you have a purpose in life. And that purpose was determined for your salvation. Now, Jesus put it this way. People were anxious and they were asking questions. And Jesus said in Matthew 6, 31 to 33, Do not be anxious, say, what shall we eat or, or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. And all these, these things shall be yours as well. Of course we have busy schedules. Of course we think how we're going to pay our bills. And how we're going to buy food. And what to wear. And all these things of the world. Of course we need these things, but they shouldn't be the priority of your life. We need to put God first. When you put God first, He will add these things unto you. And it's better when God gives rather than when you give. Because my generosity is limited to my possessions. But God's generosity has no limits. Because He's the owner of everything. Who do you want as a Godfather? A person or God? God? Who do you want as the main giver in your life? A person that gives you things or the God of the universe, the creator, the owner of all things? So we need to learn how to put God first and not be anxious about these things. And as Jesus said, seek His kingdom and His righteousness. And as we finish today, I want to talk a little bit about God's kingdom. Because He said, He didn't say, seek me, He said, seek my kingdom. Seek His kingdom. So, the way to find God, first you 
find the kingdom. And if you find the kingdom, then you find God. Let me give you a simple example. It is possible for you to find God without going to church. But it's much easier if you go to a church. Can you agree with me on this one? What's the church? The church is a representation of God's kingdom here on earth. And as a representation of God's kingdom as a church, we need to make this church a part of the kingdom. We need to make the church everything we do, the building, the elements, everything we say, everything we do, needs to be bring glory to the Lord. Because this is part of God's kingdom. Amen? Amen. This church is not for rent. <laughs> We're not renting the church to businesses. Hello? Why? Because this is God's kingdom, and God's kingdom is not for rent or for sale. This is God's kingdom. So as we are here in God's kingdom, and this is God's house, we should respect this place as God's house. We need to seek the kingdom and the righteousness of the kingdom. Now both the Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke talk about the kingdom. And I would I like to bring you a definition and it's a little bit small over there. But there's the literal and the figurative uh, meaning of this word kingdom. Literal, there's two kingdoms. There's God's kingdom, He rules. And there's the kingdom of darkness, Satan rules. So these are two separate kingdoms. Jesus said that you are either in one or another. You cannot be in between. Some people say, I'm not uh, walking with God, but I'm not walking with the devil. That's an illusion. If you're not walking with God, you're under the authority of the other kingdom. The one which is on earth. The one which is in control, listen, of the economy of this world. Or do you think God is in control of the economy of this world? If he, if he wants, He changes things. But right now, there's a kingdom here on earth, which is powerful. It's the kingdom of darkness. That, and this kingdom tries to defeat, defeat the kingdom of God. Now God, because He's a supernatural God, He will say, Okay, I'm going to give a prime minister to Canada, which is a Christian. You think it's a good thing? That's what we have. We have a prime minister, which is a Christian. Is the country prospering? I think it is. You think it's prospering? I think it's prospering. Look at the rest of the world. Compare with the, the, the country south of us. Unfortunately, they have a president, excellent person. He's not a Christian. He says he is, but he, his actions doesn't, don't prove that he's a Christian. Is their economy going well? I don't think so. Are people getting rich there? Of course they are. What are the powers in operation? Let me tell you. The kingdom of darkness. So God is always trying to see if ourselves, if the church here on earth, can obtain power and rule the nation. But while we're here on earth, we'll always have this struggle. But I have news for you. Jesus said, I will come back. And I will establish my kingdom. And this is uh, up to come. It's not yet. So already, the timing of the kingdom, now we know that Jesus healed people, cast out demons, and He rose from the dead. And uh, we know that in the future, true Christians will have full, forgive, full forgiveness and will be in heaven with our Lord. So that will be in the future. And not yet, we know that Jesus will return to judge men and the angels. That's the kingdom. He will return. While He doesn't return, we have this battle. We have a battle between flesh and spirit. We have a battle between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of heaven. We're in the middle of this battle and we've made a choice. We've said, I will walk with God. It doesn't matter if the kingdom of darkness tries to seduce me. I chose Jesus. Amen. And my choice in the past will determine my future. That's the rule of the kingdom. Now, we know that true Christians will see God, will live forever in a new place, new heavens, with resurrected bodies. Isn't that great? That's what the Bible says. It's not yet now. So we have the kingdom of the future, and we have the kingdom right now. We have this kingdom here on earth, and we chose to live in God's kingdom.
kingdom, why Satan has still a rule in this earth? Why Satan has still control of parts of the economy? Why Satan has still control of parts of science and, and education and realms of society? We made a choice. And I want to challenge you. Make a choice. Make the right choice. Because one day, this, this body is going to die. But the spirit inside of you will go to the presence of God. And you have the opportunity here on earth to say yes to the Lord. So when your body dies, you'll be forever with God. Amen. But I have also news for you. If you decide to just turn your back to the Lord and live the way you want it, can you expect forgiveness? Maybe you say we have a good God, but we have a righteous God. And He gives you the opportunity here on earth to decide whether you live the eternity with Him or if you will live an eternity separated from Him in the place of suffering that we call hell. Because we don't want people to go to hell, we proclaim this message. We don't proclaim it sometimes like fire and brimstone, but it has to be very clear, and this is black and white. Either you have Jesus Christ, and you have everlasting life, or you don't have it, and you're doomed. And I want to give you the opportunity, not to find the religion, not to follow God by fear, but start to know God. Because as you start to know Him, it will be voluntary. It's not because you're afraid of going to hell, but it's because you want to be with the Lord, with the one that loved you, that gave His life for you. The one that loves you so much that while you're an enemy of Him, who was willing to surrender His life in order to receive you in His kingdom. We don't walk with God because we're afraid of going to hell. We walk with God because we love Him. And if you love God, you have an opportunity today right now to change your attitude. The key for a victorious life is to seek God's kingdom. You'll arrive at the door and as you arrive at the door you need to have a key. God gave us a key. It's called salvation. It was sealed by the blood of Jesus. And one day when you leave this earth you'll be able to find the door and say, I, I have a key. Another definition in the word of God and this is uh, the last thing I want to mention before we pray. In all of our ways, we need to acknowledge the Lord. And we have a promise. If we recognize God, He will straighten our path. I don't know how many of you had to, to cross a, a mountain in order to go to another destination and do it on foot. I had to do it many times. Cross a mountain on foot to get to the other side. I drink with a car, a bicycle, other things. But I crossed and uh, with backpacks and carry uh, you know, stuff with me. It's not easy. And as we go up, we think, oh, it, it would be great to have a tunnel here. It would be great to have a way to cross a bridge here. God loves, loves you so much that He has this promise. He said, acknowledge me in all of your ways and I will lower the mountain. I will make the bridge. I will make a straight path so you can cross. This is God's promise for all of those that acknowledge, that recognize Jesus Christ. You can come to church and you're not putting Jesus first. But I have news for you when you put Jesus first. In Haggai chapter 2 and verse 23. He says, I will make you like my silent ring, for I have chosen you, declares the God, the Lord God Almighty. God said, I will make you my silent ring. Well, we don't use silent rings very often. I was uh, reading people and I noticed John after them there has a silent ring, beautiful. It looks like a silent ring. But uh, we don't use these rings uh, very often. A silent ring was used in the days when the, the, the Old Testament was written, as a seal, they would use the ring with wax to seal a message. And when someone will receive a message sealed by the silent ring, they will identify the sender. So uh, if someone will receive a 
papyrus or something with the, with the message, they could see the silent ring and they would say, oh, this is from the king. This is from, from that special nobleman. And God said, I will make you my silent ring. The meaning of this promise is that God wants to make it the ones that proclaim the truth, that proclaim the gospel to others. And He wants to seal His words. And He wants to use you as the silent ring, as the message that is being sent to the world, saying there is hope. Let us all stand.